Hello, everyone. Um, it's me again, Nikola Cvetkovic, uh, your host of the um, Konstantin uh, meetups. Uh, as you all know, Konstantin is the developers community, uh, started in Serbia, but uh, started to expand um, globally. Uh, we do uh, a bunch, uh, we bring in a bunch of KeyCast speakers uh, to talk about um, different topics, developer topics, um, and we cover uh, a wide range um, of uh, interesting problems uh, that happen in the real world uh, with some of the top leading um, experts in the developer field. So um, right now uh, we have uh, in the new series of online meetups, we have already had uh, two interesting topics, uh, eight, uh, another uh, already scheduled to go. So go visit Constantine.com um, and register for the upcoming events as well. Um, it's organized by the No Limit Hub, a nonprofit NGO uh, from Serbia that uh, supports um, developers, a community of developers and uh, entrepreneurship. Um, and uh, Konstantin started as um, one of the biggest um, IT conferences um, in, in Serbia. And now we have decided to expand it in this kind of online format and uh, uh, shared the knowledge of uh, the great speakers that have decided uh, to devote their time and share uh, their knowledge uh, with our community. Uh, so today uh, with us, uh, we have uh, Nicolas uh, Frankel. So Nicolas, uh, welcome aboard. And uh, thank you for uh, taking your time uh, to come and, and share uh, the interesting topic um, that we'll be talking about today, that's caching. Especially we'll be talking about a guided tour on of caching uh, patterns. So um, as kind of many of the listeners probably uh, already know, uh, when the application starts to, to slow down, uh, the reason is probably the, the bottleneck somewhere um, um, in the execution chain. So uh, sometimes this this bottleneck is due to uh, maybe um, um, a bug in the code. Uh, sometimes it's just like not optimal configuration or like a, a really large database that needs to be fetched. Um, and uh, sometimes just that data is so large that kinda, it kind of needs a lot of time to, to execute a query. And that kind of, um, if we're shifting from uh, a page to page, that can kind of uh, add up and kind of ruin the, the the experience for for the end user. So uh, today we'll be speaking um, about uh, how can we handle uh, su such a problem, like some some of the ways how we can um, handle them, um, how we can um, measure it, maybe uh, of like oh, the things that we want to um, kind of improve, um, and also. Uh, We'll be looking at what are the trade-offs when, if you want to implement caching as a mechanism um, to kind of uh, improve the speed uh, of your application. So we'll be talking about specific patterns. So this should be, at least I'm expecting it to be, uh, uh, very applicable to different uh, types of um, applications. Um, so, uh, and caching is something that every developer should have in his kind of uh, handbook. Uh, of, of tricks up his sleeve. So uh, no matter which technology they work on. Um, and uh, who who better to tell us about that, that than uh, Nicholas here. Um, he has uh, more than 15 years of uh, experience consulting uh, many different, um, different customers in a wide range of contexts. So you've been working in, in, with telecoms, with insurance, with uh, large retailers and public sectors, banking, et cetera. Um, if I understand correctly, your main expertise is, is kind of Java um, applications um, and especially like Spring technologies, uh, but you're also passionate about uh, rich internet applications, testing, CI, CD, DevOps, uh, etc. You currently work for uh, Hazelcast um, and uh, you're a double uh, as a trainer and triple as a book author. So uh, that's not something uh, a lot of developers uh, can uh, say and brag, brag with. So uh, author of, of multiple books. Um, thank you, Nicolas, for, for taking your time to be with us. We're looking forward to hearing uh, your um, 
your talk. Just a couple of uh, kind of technical stuff before we go into um, the presentation. I will be dropping in uh, like people are already probably used to uh, asking some some questions, uh, which I think might might help um, the, the audience understand slightly better um, the the topic and maybe connect it to to some of the stuff uh, that they're working on. Um, we'll have uh, a real uh, live net not live real online live uh, uh, networking uh, chat for the participants to kind of meet each other and maybe uh, meet a couple of uh, people after the talk uh, so that's just for the people who join us live uh, it will be like a five minute chat roulette uh, mix up uh, so you will meet other participants or maybe nicholas here um, or myself so stay till the end uh, to to join on that um, you, as you see, uh, you can share your presentation. Uh, just go ahead uh, and let's uh, let's learn about uh, the caching patterns. Thank you, Nicolas, and the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Nicola. Yeah, I see there are a lot of Nicola. Uh, hello, everybody. Thanks to be here for this talk about the guided tour of caching patterns. Um, well, I've been introduced. I'm Nicola Frankel. I've been a developer for a long time. I still think I'm a developer, even though now I'm working as a developer advocate. And yeah, I've been a lecturer for more than 20 years. So if this sounds, this presentation sounds like a lecture, probably it's because it is. Um, again, I've been doing talks online for more than one year. If I just talk to my screen, it's not super interesting for me and probably not very engaging for you. So if you've got any question, anything, well, just write it down in the chat and Nicola will jump in and, and, and ask the question. I work for a company called Hazel of Costs. Um, we have two products. The first one is an in-memory data grid, and you can think about an in-memory data grid as uh, distributed data structures. So just like, like associative array or queue or list or set or whatever. And the other is called JET, and it's an in-memory stream processing engine. I will use them in my demo, but this talk is not about them. It's just that I have a lot of code to show, and I need to use something. And well, I'm more familiar with those products, but um, whatever I will be telling here is uh, like completely um, can be abstracted away from the implementation. So the first thing that you need to remember from this talk is that caching is a trade-off. That's the most important stuff. Caching is not something you should frown upon. Caching is not the magical solution to every performance issue. Caching is a conscious decision. And when you make the decision, in general, you are faced with the problem that you actually need to return data, but the source of truth takes time to return the data. So it's better to cache it locally, so you return it fast. Or sometimes the sort of truth is not always available, such as microservices, for example, and you still need to return somehow. So the idea is that you prefer speed or availability over correct data. And as engineers, it's really bad because we love correct data. But in most cases, it's probably better to return slightly inaccurate data and then not return at all or return like too slowly. The best example I have is, hey, like microservices are, are super popular, even if I think that's really, really a bad idea. But let's imagine you have implemented a microservice architecture and uh, it, it's about your, your e-commerce application. So you've got your catalog service, you've got your payment service, you've got your card service, you've got your checkout service, you've got your pricing service. So uh, the customers, they put stuff in the cart and they go to checkout and you need to go to the pricing service. And the pricing service is not available because there is a network partition, because uh, there was a misconfiguration, because there are no resources in the Kubernetes cluster anymore. And so they killed all your payment services, microservices, there are any number of reasons. If we are at this point and you cannot get the price, the final price of the card, the customer will leave and will go somewhere else. 
you won't come back. You will lose a sale, you will lose a reputation, really, really bad. So in that case, it's better to cash the price in the checkout service to return any price. And probably it will be a slightly wrong price, but it's still good. At the end of the day, if you return a lot of slightly wrong prices, sometimes a bit above, sometimes a bit below, in the, at the end of the day, it will be nearly averaged. And more importantly, the business will be happy because in e-commerce, you need to sell, to sell, to sell, even if it's at a slightly outdated price. So it's not about engineering being perfect, being precise. We are not doing a mathematical computation. We just are there to implement a business feature. In that case, we must sell. And so caching helps a lot. And here I took an example. I mean, there are examples everywhere. Second lesson from this talk. You might have heard about not rolling your own crypto. It's really bad. Well, don't roll out your own cash either. And I'm guilty of that. I did that. It's really, really bad idea. Like you say, oh, but the cash is just a key value store. So whatever the language you are using, you are using, I don't know, Java, you are using HashMap, you are using Python, you are using dictionary, well, you are using associative arrays. Hey, it's just very easy. I will just like create one and put everything. Yes, but what happens at some point, your cache will get more and more and more and more entries and it will fill up the memory and the memory of your cache will compete with the memory of your application. And at some point, because we are unfortunately living in the real world, there is a hard limit. So you will reach the limit and you will get, depending on your uh, uh, runtime and out of memory or, or whatever. So you say, oh, that's easy. Then I just put a limit on my hash map or whatever. Okay, you put a limit. And then what happens when you reach that limit and you need to add an additional entry into the cache? Well, in general, caching providers like companies or products who, like that offers this kind of stuff, they have a strategy. Like it might be remove the least recently used or remove the least frequently used, or perhaps they provide a dedicated strategy so you can wrap a priority. That's something that you, you need to do like again. And what about the time to live? Like when you put entry into the cache, there the data will be stale, but the longer it stay there, the larger the drift. So if the, I, I mentioned the price before, if the cache is for five minutes, well, you probably might assume that if the, uh, the, the cache entry is there for two weeks, the, the gap between the, the real price and the cash price will probably be bigger after two weeks. So we need, every time we need, we, we put an entry into the cash, there is probably like a time to live. And so you need an additional thread to remove entries after this time to live and so on and so forth. So when you start A, it's just an associative array, but when you start digging into the stuff, you understand there are a lot and a lot of features. So whatever provider you are using, Hazelcast or any other, they probably have all those features. So don't roll out your own cash use like a professional caching provider. As I mentioned, size limit, cache invalidation, time to live, whatever. Then you have additional features that you might benefit from. You might have like distributed. As I mentioned, Hazelcast is distributed. Other products are also distributed. Um, Ours is distributed in the open source version. Just want to mention that. Um, now you, you you need to decide how will you serialize your uh, your entities? Will they be serialized in JSON format, in binary format? Do you want to have multiple languages accessing the same data? This kind of stuff. And well, this is basically a very very rich feature set. And perhaps some of the features you will need them now. Perhaps some of the features you will need them later, perhaps some of the features you will never need them. So you, you need really like to really evaluate each product depending on your needs. So just to sum it, sum it up for, for maybe those who haven't actually, maybe don't have a computer science degree and like don't understand how caching works. 
Uh, I don't have any computer science degree. Just between you and me, folks, don't worry. I'm, an <laughs> I'm a real world architect. I, I, I have been trained to build buildings, but I don't know nothing about computer science. So, so just want to kind of go back to, to what you just said. So like there is an option for you to kind of store it in a data table and basically just keep dropping uh, stuff there. But there's a different option, which is basically a solution which kind of manages that this kind of cache uh, data set for you and does all, does all these cleanup and management and all these other features um, um, for you. And that's kind of the, the, the difference that you mentioned, right? I mean, there is this idea that you use your own memory structure mm -hmm. and then when you start thinking about, oh, but I need to do this, I need to do that, then you will see that as I mentioned, there are other features that become necessary that yep. a simple in-memory structure doesn't have, but mm -hmm. that is provided by, I don't know, in Java, there would be Guava, uh, Hazel cost, mm -hmm. whatever. And so, yeah, don't, don't, don't develop it, please. Uh, you are not paid to develop a cache. You are probably paid to develop business features. <laughs> and so if you spend like two months is developing your own cache, probably there will be bugs, uh, you will be missing tests. And well, it will be like two months of money spent for, for nothing. Unless you want to create a cash, caching product, which is fine. We are very happy that you do, uh, even if there are a lot already of products, uh, of existing products, but then then your business is caching. But if your business is e-commerce, is banking, is anything else, well, don't spend time like reinventing the wheel. Got it, thanks. So we have a cache now um, and we start by doing the, what everybody does when we use a cache is cache aside, meaning that actually when you ask the value of uh, the application, the application itself will try to get the value from the cache. Then if the value is null, it will get it from the data store. And if it's not null, it will put it in the cache. So the next time you get the value, you return it from the cache directly. That's the cache aside pattern. And I mean, it's very straightforward. Your application manages the flow. First, get the value from the cache. Then if it's null, get the value from the data store. Then if it's not null, put it into the cache, return the value. Next time, get the value from the cache. Oh, it's there, return the value immediately. And now you can see that probably there is a time to live so that once it has been set into the cache, it's not there forever. So the next time you ask for it, then it might be there, it might not be there. I mean, it depends on your configuration. So that's the, the, like the most straightforward way. I didn't say it's the best way, just it's the most straightforward way. So let's see how it works. And I'm a Java developer, but I wanted to show something like interesting. Uh, so my application, uh, my starting application is actually from Python. So I, I hope that you understand Python. I hope that you don't ask me to explain you all the Python stuff because I, it will be very hard for me. I just like, you know, like coded everything and ask my, um, my colleague, hey, is it Pythonic enough? He told me, yes, it's good enough, so it's fine. So now I will put it on branch master. So I don't see all that all the crap. Okay. And this is just what I just mentioned. Uh, this is the like basic application. So it's, uh, I don't know who is a Python developer, who is a Java developer. I have no clue about your profile. If you are not JS developer, perhaps, perhaps you can write it down into the chat. That would be nice. Um, if, if you've got like, just tell me. So I can uh, like better know what to explain and not to explain. If you are all Python developers, then probably I don't need to explain anything. Uh, if you are all Java developers, that depends. Okay, so uh, this is a Flask application. I'm using the Flask framework. The first thing that I'm doing uh, when I start the application, I will like create the database and I will add some dummy data, like just 
I don't want to do that by myself. And then I have like a couple of routes. I have the basic route where I get all the persons. So I'm using something called SQL Alchemy that allows me to uh, query my database and I return a JSON representation. Then I can query by primary key or I can post for a new person. So when I start this application, and now it's the fun part because like in every demo, um, there is a chance it doesn't work. Otherwise it wouldn't be that fun. Um, so I will just clear that and I will curl HTTP slash slash low colors. So nobody wants to tell me what language they are programming in. You are all very, very shy, I understand it. So let's see. Yes, it returns me uh, like my first ID, Joe Delton, and he, he, he was born there. So just let's check that the, the ID one is Joe Delton. Yeah, Joe Delton, and he has the correct uh, time. So that's my starting point. And now I say, oh, the data source, and actually it's very stupid because um, it's just a SQL light stuff. So it's, it's not very far away, but let's imagine that it's a very, very far away uh, database or C sharp and Java. So I, and I, I'm telling you about Python. Yeah, that's the fun. That's the fun of the stuff. So I hope that uh, it's not too complicated. I mean, I could understand it, so probably you can. Uh, if I had known, of course, I would have provided a Java application. And there will be some Java afterwards. Don't worry. Don't, don't worry. The code is less important. The concepts are, are what matters. Okay. So here I'm using a SQLite database. So it's pretty stupid to cache. But it, let's imagine that it's a very remote database and it takes ages to get. And I want to cache the value. So the next step is actually to implement the cache aside pattern. So what I'm doing is I will uh, like add some caching and here I will be, as, as I mentioned, I will be using Hazelcast. So now what I'm doing here, I will say, hey, when I get all, when I return all, then I will put every one of the person in the cache. And when I get one, I will first check if the cache contains the PK, then I will return the entry and if it doesn't, then I will get it from the database and then I will put it in the cache. And then when I post it, I will set it in the cache directly. That's pretty straightforward, I believe. Again, if you have questions, just don't be afraid. So now I need to start it, but I didn't start any caching capabilities yet. So I will just need to start the cache. I will use my other window to do that. So here I'm starting uh, Hazelcast distributed cache. And when it has started, it, it's a Java application. So it starts a bit of time. And now I can curl it. And of course, it hasn't started yet. So yes, I've, I've got it. And if we check the logs, we can see that the person with PK1 was not found in the cache. I just started the cache. And now it's set in the cache. Now, if I like query again, we can see that it was found in the cache. So it was directly returned from the cache. And because I have like, uh, I, I, I can set everything when I query all entities. And you can see that I forgot to remove myself with my demo before because I did that again. Uh, I put all of the entities. And now if I ask for an entity that I didn't query specifically, it's, it's found in the cache. So now the cache is completely full and very happy. Everything works as expected. So that's the cache aside pattern. And in general, that's how we start with caching. We all did that. But we can see it's, it's not that great. And especially that now your application um, is actually uh, coupled to both the cache and the data store, and it's responsible for the flow. And perhaps you don't want uh, your application to be responsible for the flow, because that, that means that um, you need first to query the cache, and then you say, oh, but uh, perhaps I didn't find it in the cache, then I put it in the data store, but then it fails. And I mean, 
with the, the exception, the errors that you might get, you, you need to be really sure about what happens, like very, very deeply. So the next step is, okay, in Cache's side, we are actually like using our cache just like a hash map. We are not using any of the capability of the cache provider. Um, the next step is to do, um, oh, doesn't work, yes. Um, it is to do, um, sorry, uh, I have the same for cache side. The next step is to do some read through. So by doing read through, actually, when we are reading, we are not going to the data store. We are delegating the reading to the cache. And as I mentioned, like it means that your cache provider needs to provide this capability. Most do, some don't, but we go a bit uh, further than just, hey, it's just like a hash map, it's a key value store, we don't care. We are actually using the features that the cache provider is using. So now what happens is that we only interact, at least for reading, we only interact with the cache and it's up to the cache to get the value inside itself. And if the value is not inside itself, then it will get the value from the data store. It will, of course, return the value and it will set the value. Then next time, of course, when you get the value, it's already there, so you return the value. So it's a bit more involved and it requires a, a deeper knowledge of your cache. Uh, you go beyond the key value store. So let's see how it works. Now I will show you some Java code. <laughs> so what I will be doing, I will be uh, stopping the this and for convenience purpose, because I want everything to be co-located, I have added one more project. And this project is called Cache. And it will do the exact same as when I launch it with, ah, with HZ Start. Um, the only thing that here, normally what I would do, I would just package that class into a jar and put it on the class pass of the hedge um, of the Hazel class cluster. Here, I'm just launching it directly from the IDE for demos. It's much, much better. So I have configured it accordingly. So here I have created a map store that delegates to the SQL map loader. And what the SQL map loader does is exactly what I told you, it will load it from the database. So here, if you have been doing Java, you might recognize a GDBC query, but that's not the important bit. The important bit is now my application, my main application is actually not using the cache to read. So you get directly from the cache, you didn't, in, sorry, you don't interact with the database at all. So I removed everything that was database dependent here. So I will start the caching store, the, the caching nodes. So does that mean that literally all the requests are going through cache now? This one, yes. This one, yes. The posts, not yet, but it will be the next step. Mm -hmm. I'm but trying to remove the adherence, the, the dependency of my application to the data store. Before it was dependent on the cache and the data store, and it uh, it had to handle the flow. Now I remove, I try to remove dependency one by bit by bit, and to say, oh, I, I don't really need the database. At least right now, I will need part of the database, and I will try to like leverage the caching uh, provider feature to just interact with the cache. So now I have started the cache. Now I start the application. Let's start the application. But like in production, I would assume that you wouldn't want to cache the whole application. So uh, you would probably just use this for like certain requests that like it's, need to be there, right? Uh, I, I, I disagree. Um, in production, you might want to cache everything. It depends a lot on your use case. It depends, as I mentioned, caching is a trade-off. So either you are afraid that your like source of truth, whether it's a database or web service is, is, is not available or that it's too slow. 
So in, in, yeah. in, in some cases, you might want to cache in, at, in every case. In some cases, you might say, oh, I will cache, but the time to leave will be like 10 seconds. And in some cases, you might, you might want to say, oh, I want to cache some stuff, but not cache some others. That's, that's very context dependent. Yeah. So, for example, one case which which can uh, I, I see might be a problem. So, like in every application, you have some type of users, right? And mm -hmm. somebody needs to register as a new user. So, like if you cache the whole application, including the users, that means that like when he's creating an account, uh, then like will there be a mechanism to trigger? Uh, the manual update as well, not just based on time and kind of auto clearing of the cache, but like how it is, because like there are certain parts of the application which kind of have this kind of requirement and like 99% of the application can be cached. So what, well, I will try to uh, rephrase your question. So uh, mm -hmm. you are saying, hey, in some cases you will cache some references from the source of truth. And what happens if the source of truth is changed? And that means that your cached entity won't be in sync, correct? Is that? Yes, what yes, yes. That's a very good question. So the, the first answer is very easy. And it's part of, you might know this quote, there are three hard things in computer science, naming things, cache invalidation and off by one errors. And of course, that's supposed to be a joke. Of course, like online, it's not as funny, um, but let's focus on cache invalidation. You need to think very deeply and it's really a hard problem. Again, it's context dependent. What is the acceptable time to leave of your entry in the cache? If you say, oh, like I always, always want my entity to be up to date in the cache, well, just don't use the cache because you need the source of truth every time. So now it's not a binary stuff. On, on, on one hand, you will say, oh, I need to have the exact, the exact value. And so you don't cache. On the other side, you say, oh, I need to return or to return fast or to return at all costs. And so in between, you have a whole range of possibilities. So it's not black or white. It's not binary. It's, oh, I want to take this risk. So I accept that in most cases, the value will be good and I will return fast. But sometimes it happens that the value might be wrong. I will still return fast. That's up to you to decide. Again, it's very context dependent. I will show you afterwards, there are some steps afterwards where I can like make the window where the value is desynchronized very, very, very small. As small as possible, of course, it's not, not always null, but it's much better. So now I, I've started the application. I've started um, the um, cache. And what I will be doing, I will be curling because I'm curling all the time. This is a curl demo. And here we can see that I got now, here I got the results. And as you saw, I didn't, like load anything from the database. So it, it directly comes from the cache. So here, what I've been doing is I preloaded because I, I, I cheated a bit because I started the application. So when I started the application, I, re, I loaded all the keys. So all the keys are now loaded in the cache. And so when I get it, it's preloaded, it's already in the cache. But if I didn't preload anything, I would still be able to get the, the entity because it would like execute this query and afterwards it would be set into the cache. And here you can see that uh, hazard cost is taking care of it for you. I don't put it explicitly into the cache. It's just an interface to load and it will be, it will be the one doing the flow that I uh, shown you in uh, the cache side stuff. Now we can be a bit more involved and we can also do write through 
So when uh, we do write through, sorry, I am, I, I, oh, not this one, this one. So doing write through is even simpler. Uh, you, you just tell the application, hey, set the value. The application say, uh, calls the cache and says set the value and the cache handles the database port. So now if we go like one more bit further and sorry, it's the Git one. I will check out this. So now when I'm posting, I will get directly the stuff from the curl and I will just interact with the cache. I don't interact with the database anymore, but to initialize, initialize the data in the beginning. So I just need to restart the cache. So there are ways that you can do that, uh, like hot reloads, but it's a bit more involved. And again, it's very specific to Hazelcast. I don't want to show you too much about this. Now our ha SQL map store also implements the map store. And so we have a couple of additional um, methods. So now we can store one ID. And now I'm doing like whatever code is necessary. And here, since I'm using a SQL database, I'm using GDBC, but you could use GPA if you prefer, or Spring Data GPA if you prefer. But here I, I wanted as less depend. Uh, uh, um, um, not that many dependencies, so I prefer to use like plain GDBC, and so I have no dependency. Now, what I can do is I can uh, like curl and I can curl to post some data, so x posts, and I think it's like this. Now I need to remember because every time I do it wrongly, mm -hmm. and it's content type application slash JSON. And it's data. So here it will be first name, uh, let's say hello, uh, and last name. And I will be saying Constantin. And I will need to pass an ID because my SQLite doesn't generate ID. And let's say 20 because I think here it has not been used before. And let's pray that it works. It seems to be working. Now, if I curl entity 20, it's there. Amazing. And now something that I didn't do, but uh, I can check now uh, is let's query to see if it has been saved in the database. I probably, it won't work because, oh no, it works. Yay, amazing. Yay, yay, it works. <laughs> I'm so happy. Um, Plus one for the live demo. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's always a risk, but it's always fun when it works. So here yeah. you can see that uh, it, it's, it saved it. And my application didn't do anything. Everything was done from the cache side. So I prepared everything from the cache side. And now my application is not handling any uh, like connection with the database or whatever. My application is just like interacting with the cache. The cache itself is the one responsible to load and to store and to handle everything. Yeah. And just to, to kind of, uh how I would understand this is that like a read through and write through would work in conjunction with one another. Is that general, correct? Yes, in general, yes. But as you can see, you can implement read through without implementing write through. Um, I, I don't think it makes a lot of sense, but uh, perhaps I didn't find the right context yet. Um, so yeah, if you're just kind of reading some, yeah, usually they would go hand in hand. So like, but you still kind of one is used to read from the cache and kind of then cache handles the writing in the uh, data store and the other one to 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 write into it. But like, yeah, uh, yeah. so ju just to kind of look under the hood, what's happening?
in there uh, for, uh, for, for these two examples. So like how, how I would assume that what's ha happening uh, underneath uh, is that uh, actually you get an instant reply from, from the cache system, but mm -hmm. then they're executing the, the SQL commands, which could take quite a while to kind of update, uh, let's say a huge uh, data store or like a huge request. So you get basically an instant feedback, like, yeah, the, the role has been updated um, and you get a confirmation, but what actually happens happens afterwards. And like, there is a slight chance that things might go wrong um, after you get the confirmation from the cache. So That's actually that a wrong assumption. Okay. With, with uh, read through and write through, you are blocking. Mm -hmm. So you will talk to the cache and the cache will do the magic to the database or to wherever, then it will return and it will return again. And mm -hmm. um, I don't know when you did last UML, but you can see that this is like synchronous. Oh yeah, okay, okay, yeah. So it's now, waiting for the response. Exactly. Now, the next step is called right behind. And then I have modeled it wrong because here, you, ah, no, here it's, it's correct. Sorry, I've modeled it correctly. So now it's asynchronous. Mm -hmm. And actually, that's exactly what you described. So you get yeah. your value very, very fast. At least you get something very, very fast. So you are not blocking, but there is a chance that the cache doesn't write the stuff in the data store in that you are correct. So again, it's another trade-off where you are saying, hey, I want to be non-blocking, I want to be asynchronous, but then you let go of the guarantee that, okay, you are sure that it's in the data store. Yep. And it's, uh, but your comment is really good. So that's the difference between right behind and right through. Right through in synchronous, right behind is asynchronous, no guarantees. And with Hazel cost, the configuration is like really, really easy to go from one to the other is like this. <laughs> That's the only thing that you need to do to go from like to being synchronized to being asynchronized. Just like an additional, uh, an additional configuration parameter. And now we need to go a bit further in, in, the, um, in the presentation because as you mentioned before, uh, we've got a lot of issues when we say, hey, but I really want to be sure that my data is in sync with the database, which is a problem in, in some cases. So how do, you, uh, do, you, do we make sure of that? There are ways, again, it relies on the cache provider's uh, capabilities. So there is one thing that is called refresh ahead. And some providers do like, hey, when you put something in the cache, you probably set a TTL. And when the entry is close to invalidation, close being, hey, you need to configure it depending on your TTL, it will eagerly fetch the value from the store. So you put something in the cache for 10 minutes and like, let's say 10 seconds before it expires, it will eagerly reload it from the store. And of course it's read through because you need to access the store directly from the cache. Yeah, so the difference from the regular kind of uh, mechanism would be in the regular mechanism, it will be deleted after the time to leave, to leave passes and then you don't have the data. There is uh, the actual fetch happens at the time that you need resources. And this is kind of, uh, kind of a warm-up mechanism. So the trade-off is basically you have to keep it all, uh, all the data in the memory, basically in the uh, data, in, in the cache. Uh, yeah. It's not a warm-up. That's not a warm-up. That's the, that's, there is a slight difference. I will present another pattern in the end that is actually doing warm-up. Here okay. you're doing, I needed it the first time, the first time I will pay the cost to go to the database. Mm -hmm. And the second time it's 
like I will pay the costs asynchronously. So probably I don't pay the cost when I need the data. Mm -hmm. So well, now, ju yes. just to make sure, just to make sure I, uh, uh, we understand that. So like the, the second, the, the second case that you're mentioning here. So is the fetching happening before I need the data or at the moment that I need the data, but it's just like, let's say 10 seconds before the expiry time. And then I just want to make sure that it's synced correctly. And then even though it's still within the time to leave, I will then at that point when I need it, go and fetch it. The refresh ahead means that the first time you access it, it's not read ahead, it's refresh ahead. So the first time you actually like will pay the cost. You will ask the cache, hey, give me the value. The cache won't have it. It will fetch it, it will put it. And once it's there, it will be refreshed automatically from the database in an asynchronous fashion. So irrelevant of the request when the entry is close to invalidation. Okay. So cool. you will pay the first cost. On the good side, that means that probably you won't put anything, uh, you will put nothing that is not used into the cache. On the not so good thing, that means that if you really, really want to be fast, all the, the requests that requires a row for the first time will pay the cost. Again, it's a trade-off. Yeah. And for example, this could, one of the examples, so let, let's say we have a, an application which kind of has the campaign analytics uh, over, over time. So like this is in uh, a very, um, Oh, maybe that leave the use case for, for later. So I, I won't interrupt you now. We have a question from the audience. Better to, to answer it now. Uh, so Jovan is asking, how does it work when you use uh, Cacheable in Spring? Is Spring handling the the logic, or it's using real uh, read through or write through or something else? Um, I know there are multiple implementations of the Cache Manager interface, so perhaps it depends on the implementation. No, actually, it, regardless of the implementation, it's always using cache aside. The only difference in that case is it's not your application itself that does it. It's the Spring library inside the application. But you are not doing read through or write through either. And now I need to take some seconds because mm. my furry friend is coming to me and because now it understands that it, it's time for attention, it wants some petting. <laughs> Sorry about that. Every time I do a talk, it interrupts me. And it's just at the moment where it decides that it wants love. And of course, yeah. I cannot focus on what I'm telling you <laughs> it's around my legs. My, my dog has the same thing usually happening after an hour of, <laughs> of our uh, of, uh, of the talk. So I just want to that. switch the light on because I can see myself on the screen and it's not great. So two seconds. Yes, much better. Um, so yeah, that's refresh ahead. Again, the first time you pay the cost and afterwards you will try to keep the entity in sync. It doesn't solve uh, any problem. You still need to think about the correct time to leave. You still need to think about what is close to invalidation and there will be a window where the data will not be in sync anyway. So depending on your use case, it might be good. It might be not that good. And now finally, I have one last pattern to show you and it is cache ahead. And now you are eagerly warming up the cache like you wanted before. <laughs> and it relies on, on Jet, actually. So what I will be doing here is I will be implementing something called change data capture. And if you've never heard about change data capture, I infer that you have used uh, or at least heard about event sourcing. Event sourcing is the idea that instead of having a mutable state in your database where you actually change the state every time, you will store the events that led to the state. And that when you want to get to know the state, you actually 
replay all the events. So you will understand the history of everything. And it's much more detailed than just having a column with saying, hey, last updated timestamp or last value of this kind of stuff. Now, the problem with this approach is that, um, well, if when you replay the event, since the number of events might be very, very, very long, probably you will need to have snapshots in between. So we'll, you will need to store the states anyway, just snapshots of different states. And then you completely need to change the way you look at your application. And if your application is already existing, it's not super great because you will need to change the database design and everything. So the idea is that now that you know about event sourcing, change data capture is the complete opposite. So you keep the state and you create, create events out of it. So every time you send an update and insert or delete, or even when you change uh, the database uh, schema, it will create an event that you can capture and do something. And when you couple it with like like with streaming, like just like Jet, what we, we can do is we can put a listener on the data store. So every time there is a change, we will get the change and we will set the value. So every time we do change the database row, the database record, the cache will be updated. And that is cache ahead. And then that's even better, the application doesn't know at anything at all about the data store. It just knows about the cache. It just interacts with the cache all the time. So what can we do? Again, little demo. This one is a bit more involved even than the other ones. So I've created a couple of stuff. I have created, uh, so I still have my cache. I I have created this cache ahead stuff and we can see, I, I don't want to, to go into too much detail because- so not... Just before you dive into the code, can, can we take yes. just, just a minute to, to recap yes. Uh, yes. on this stuff? Because it's a little bit different concept. Just want to make sure that yes. we're all on the same page. Uh, can you put back the slide? Yeah. Um, if you can zoom it in a little bit. Yes, I can. I can do everything. <laughs> You're awesome. Awesome, that's good. So uh, ju just to recap uh, what I got from this. So uh, basically this is a completely different model. It doesn't matter yes. um, on like what you're getting, you don't, you still have a cache, which is kind of keeping the, uh, basically the exact replica of all the data, um, if I understand correctly in, in this case. And like you would have the events which will trigger the refresh of cache for certain certain records. So for uh, to, to try to put it in, in a real world example. So let's say a user um, in a web application. So a user in a web application updates his user info, whatever, updates his name. So before his whole, all his kind of personal information would be in cache as kind of, let's say user and then different properties. And then if he changes the name, then the event, which listens to uh, the actual kind of data store, like let's say, for example, MySQL um, triggers um, the uh, on, on update triggers the new. Um, it, new it's the other here. way around. So there, there are no triggers. So mm -hmm. it's not the, the data store um, I mean, I, we can talk about the implementation. Um, I didn't want to, but actually how the implementation is that there are some, well, most SQL databases, they will keep a write a head log to write whatever, what they did. Hey, here I inserted something, here I updated something. There are two reasons for that. The first reason is that's the first thing when it receives uh, 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 like a statement that says, hey, if any process crashes and it restarts, at least it can restart from this log. Okay. Mm -hmm. The second reason is that most of the time you want to have high availability, whatever that means if, in the realm of, of SQL databases. So you probably, you will have a leader and a follower and the follower needs to keep the same state so that if the dies, then it can be in the same state. 
So it will also read from this log. And both will read from the same log. So there will be eventual consistency at this, uh, uh, when they apply the same stuff in the same order, they will be in the same state. That's actually what we are reading from. We are reading from this write ahead log. So mm -hmm. we will be doing the same stuff. We'll be reading the events and transforming them and sending them to the cache or to wherever, actually. You can use this change data capture to do a lot of stuff. Um, I, I, I use it in one of my other talk to do zero downtime deployments. So I copy data from one database to the other so that the uh, application pods, they read from one database and when they are killed, they read from the other and there is no uh, downtime. You, you can do a lot of stuff. I mean, it, yeah. it's it's very low level. So there are a lot yeah. of business. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of, of business uh, features that you can implement. Yeah. But just you can basically write a compiler which transforms whatever you type in one language into kind of an insert in different kind of uh, different it's type of data. For you. It's written for you. So I, I just want to show you the code so that you can understand whether it's 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 a lot or not. Now it's Java. They actually like like uh, it's Jet. So it's Java. Uh, here is just a, a simple main application. I just wait until the SQL is up just to be sure because sometimes it doesn't work that well. And that is the most important part. That is the pipeline. And you can see that it reads pretty much like English. You read from my SQL and then you add the timestamps and then you map to the value of the change record. The red change record is the object that you get. And then you change the, the, the record spot to a map and then to a JSON. And then from the JSON, you create an entry in the cache where the value will be the JSON itself and the ID will be the ID. And then you write to the cache. The rest is pretty much here. You can see it's like only configuration. The primitives are already available for you. Here, the cache, it's also pretty configuration. What you just need to do is, hey, tell me which cache I should update. The hardest part, and when it's hard, it's like, is, hey, here, I need to change it to a JSON object. <laughs> and I'm not sure that's really that hard. So it's pretty, pretty straightforward. At least I believe it's pretty forward. And how does it work in, 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 uh, in real life? Uh, so I've created a Docker Compose file. So here I have the cache. So that will replace this module. Okay, I have the application. And here I'm using MySQL, I'm using a real database. I'm not using SQLite anymore. And it will replace this module. Then I have the pipeline. So this is what I've shown you. This is the cache ahead stuff. And I have the MySQL database. So now if I docker up that, oh, I need to stop. Everything has been stopped. That's good. I won't have any port conflict. Docker compose up. And the application now becomes the following. The application is no dependent, not, not dependent anymore from the database. Even now I'm, I'm running in production. So the uh, data initialization, it's done on in production. Now I'm only interacting with the cache and I, I trust that the cache is always, always, always um, uh, in sync. And now it should have started. Blah, 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 blah. So you can see a lot of stuff happening. So now it has started. And yes, blah, blah, blah. At some point, yes, you see, now there was data in the database. It was written in the write ahead log. And now my cache, even though I didn't do anything 
has been refreshed with those values. So now if I do my usual curl, no, not here, here. If I do my usual curl, curl HTTP localhost 5000 slash one, I get my data. And the cache here doesn't interact with the database at all. There is nothing. I remove every interaction from the cache to the database. Everything happens directly. So now it's not that I am pulling the data when I need it, it's pushed. The data is pushed to the cache every time it is changed. Yeah, it seems like it's magical. I know it's it seems very strange, um, but it is it is actually it is cash ahead. It is cash ahead, and it works like yeah. It, it seems magical, but you uh, I will give you the Git repository. You can play with it. You will see nothing is magical. This sums it up. You can you can see actually that the data store here is only like interacting with the jet, so it will read from the data store, or let's say it will be triggered by the data store, and then it will set the value to the cache. The application will do stuff with the cache. The cache becomes like a, like a data store again. It's a real data store. It's an in-memory data store, but it's a data store again. So how do we handle, so is there like just the, the virtualization and like multiple containers that need to be spinned and like we have to have this kind of scalability model in place to manage our cache in order if we no. want to use a system like this. No, no, I just did it because otherwise I would have remember, oh, I need to start this one and then to start this one. Oh, fuck, I, I, I forgot to start this one. So I need to restart again. No, here I have a Docker Compose file. I express my dependencies and it's just like it, it does it. So. It's just for ease of demo, but you don't need actually any containerization at all. You can do that like by yourself. Uh, although I would probably encourage you to use like at least Docker containers because it's much easier than to get the zip distribution to like unzip it than to start it with run.sh. It's just like much, much easier for everybody. Yeah, but in general, still here, we have a problem that if we have a real, really large database, like what if we have a lot of data in the database and like how will that then be handled? Well, it will take time, but just like anything, we are talking about distributed systems anyway. So as soon as you have distributed systems, that means that you cannot guarantee that one side will be exactly like the other side. It will be eventually consistent. However, mm -hmm. here, the eventually consistent window, the time where it's not consistent is very, very small. And that's what we want to guarantee. As soon as we do distributed system, you cannot do anything, but you want to have like 99.99% .99 of chances that it will be in sync. That's just what we want. We Again, we are not doing mathematical computation. If you do mathematical computation, you probably have locks to make sure that everything is super precise and it will be super slow. And that's fine. But in the real world, we are happy, in general, we are happy to trade like not so correct values for speed because speed is much more expensive. Like uh, you might know that, for example, Amazon did some study, I think it was already like 10 years ago, and that something that like, I think it was hundreds of milliseconds, I mean, they got two or three person drops in, in, in sales. And, and I mean, 100 or 200 milliseconds, I cannot perceive it and probably no, nobody can, but it has an effect. So in general, yes, you just make it as fast as possible. And sometimes you will be reading stale values. Most of the case, like, hey, we are we are returning the wrong price. Uh, who cares? Who cares? Okay, you will be selling, you will be like over overselling by five dollars on a hundred dollar stuff. If the customer buys, that's great. 
If you're underselling by $5, that's great either. And again, by the end of the day, everything will be average, but you will have sold. Uh, I'm sorry I'm using e-commerce a lot because I've been working in e-commerce, but there are a lot of other contexts where speed trumps uh, like correctness. Absolutely. Uh, cool. So maybe it, it, it could be, uh, so just while we're on this one because it's the most complex one. Um, so how much extra work does it go to actually maintain uh, all your systems kind of <laughs> uh, cash ahead uh, compatible and what happens if we kind of forget to do it in certain places like will that kind of have a huge impact on the application or or or, or not but you, you can answer your own question how much more complexity this actually gets simpler we are actually decoupling the thing so now your cache is getting simpler. Your app is getting simpler. So we are like decoupling the complexity. Now we have an additional system that is dedicated to that. It's not more complex. Just the complexity has been rebalanced. Yeah. But, but general, you, mm -hmm. so do you... I prefer to have like a system that has dedicated responsibilities and another system that has dedicated responsibilities instead of a, of a single system that has two responsibilities that are completely, completely not coherent with each other. And the mapping that you showed in your example, which actually happens to a JSON, that, does that happen kind of with a certain library that kind of can manage kind of the, the model and then kind of do that for you? Or is that the part that you kind of need to, to map right out manual that that's the that's the thing that here you need to put in the cache in the format that the application is comfortable with so because i was using json since the beginning i will put it in json format the good thing is now i can have another application written in go or node.js because we have like clients for go and node.js and Python and C Sharp, and they can use the same cache with the same value. Got it. Uh, and uh, yeah, maybe just to, to kind of take through one example um, or, or a couple of ex real world examples and just to kind of yeah. see how you would approach caching, caching it and like what would your be kind of thinking behind like how do you evaluate which one, well, which pattern is the best for the job? Uh, hopefully it will not be all cash ahead. <laughs> uh, I have I have a table. I have okay, always a table. Awesome. So I so, haven't seen the application, although it's it's looking like I'm always one, one slide ahead. I, this is the first time I'm seeing the application. You can confirm this, Nicholas, uh, the, the presentation. Um, <laughs> so in, in, instead of, of, uh, of uh, use cases, I've just written some, hey, like this is a good, a good context and this is the cons. So cache aside is when you are limited by the capabilities of your cache providers, or you, 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 you don't know how your cache provider works, or you want to change your cache provider whenever you feel like it, you are not set, just do cache aside. Now, now your application is responsible for the orchestration flow, which might not be that great. As soon as you start being comfortable with your caching provider, just through the right through and right through, and remove all concerns about the database from the application. If you start being limited by uh, speed that you are blocking, you want to be as fast as possible, then do right behind. But just consider that in that case, you might lose data. Again, depends on the use case. Refresh ahead. Well, if you need to fetch from the data store every now and then, and you need to be fast, do refresh ahead. And of course, it's another system to maintain, just like, just like cache ahead. It's another system to maintain, but now you are nearly always in sync. So I think this um, is a good go-to uh, summary. Uh, if you want cash, 
Uh, you just need to find where you fit here. And well, by default, as I mentioned, just do read through and write through. Otherwise, you might consider the other one. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's a, a really nice overview of, of different uh, uh, patterns. So I encourage uh, people to, to write their questions in the chat. Um, so, so just yeah. to let, to finish, uh, if you liked uh, what I told you, I'm blogging, so uh, you can uh, like read my uh, weekly blog post on my blog. You can follow me on Twitter. That's always nice. Uh, here there is an article about this talk. Um, so if you prefer the writing form, you might read it. Here is the GitHub repo. So um, if you want to do that at home, uh, if you want to store it or fork it or whatever. Um, well, it, it's GitHub, so you can do whatever you want. And if uh, somehow I got you interested in Hazelcast, we have a Slack, you can ask questions, or you can get trainings for free as well. So now I leave you the words of the end. <laughs> so uh, thank you, thank you, Frankel, uh, for, for, for the presentation and the overview. It was uh, definitely um, a very nice intro for, for um, all of us uh, to kind of uh, help us differentiate between the, the different uh, patterns. Uh, we might have seen some of them along the way, but like um, I, I doubt that someone actually did like a thorough study and analysis of all the options there are and like what, what could be the best fit. So um, the, this is a really, um, really nice uh, or you. If somebody has any questions, feel free to 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 write in the comments. Uh, here are the contacts, uh, contact details where you can uh, uh, where you can uh, uh, reach Nicholas. And um, I'd like to to thank you again for for taking your time to give this presentation. Uh, I would invite everyone for the networking session. So we'll do maybe fifteen to twenty minutes. Uh, of networking kind of chat roulette. Uh, after this, uh, I, I suggest you, you share what's the language that you work in and maybe um, if you have any experience with, with caching, like what what you would like to learn or what did you like um, uh, uh, about this topic, what you can actually implement uh, starting tomorrow. Um, and um, yeah, the recording of this will also be available uh, afterwards, make sure to go to uh, constantine.com uh, to register for the future events as well and save your spot. To get notified, make sure you uh, like, subscribe to all the No Limit Hub and uh, Constantine um, uh, social profiles to not miss uh, on future events. Um,